ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਹੈ ਜੀ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਸਾਡੇ YouTube ਚੈਨਲ ਤੇ ਸੰਗਤ ਜੀ ਅੱਜ ਇਸ ਵੀਡੀਓ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਜੋਤੀ ਜੋਤ ਦਿਵਸ ਦਾ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਆਪ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਂਝਾ ਕਰਨ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਸੋ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਚੈਨਲ ਨੂੰ ਸਬਸਕ੍ਰਾਈਬ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਕਰਿਓ ਅਤੇ ਇਸ ਵੀਡੀਓ ਨੂੰ ਵੱਧ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ ਸ਼ੇਅਰ ਵੀ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਕਰਿਓ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਜਨਮ 8 ਸਾਵਨ ਸੰਮਤ 1713 ਕੀਰਤਪੁਰ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜ਼ਿਲ੍ਹਾ ਰੂਪਨਗਰ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਾਤਾ ਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਕੌਰ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਪਵਿੱਤਰ ਕੁੱਖ ਤੋਂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰ ਰਾਏ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਘਰ ਵਿਖੇ ਹੋਇਆ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਚਿਹਰਾ ਮਨਮੋਹਣਾ ਅਤੇ ਹਿਰਦਾ ਕੋਮਲ ਸੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਬਚਪਨ ਗੁਰੂ ਪਿਤਾ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰ ਰਾਏ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਨਿਗਰਾਨੀ ਹੇਠ ਬੀਤਿਆ ਜਿਸ ਕਾਰਨ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਰੱਬੀ ਸ਼ਖਸੀਅਤ ਵਾਲੇ ਗੁਣ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਜੀਵਨ ਦਾ ਹਿੱਸਾ ਬਣ ਗਏ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਭਰਾ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਬੜੇ ਚਤੁਰ ਨੀਤੀ ਨਪੁੰਨ ਅਤੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਸੰਗਤਾਂ ਅਤੇ ਮਸੰਦਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਤਕਾਰ ਦੀ ਨਿਗਾਹ ਨਾਲ ਵੇਖੇ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਸਨ ਜਦ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਨੇ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰ ਰਾਏ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਬੁਲਾਇਆ ਤਾਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਥਾਂ ਤੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਪੁੱਤਰ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰਮਤ ਦੇ ਸਿਧਾਂਤ ਸਪਸ਼ਟ ਕਰਨ ਲਈ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਭੇਜ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਬਾਦਸ਼ਾਹ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੀ ਪ੍ਰਤਿਭਾ ਨਾਲ ਬਹੁਤ ਪ੍ਰਭਾਵਿਤ ਕੀਤਾ ਅਤੇ ਬਾਅਦ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਰਾਮਾਤਾ ਵੀ ਦਿਖਾਈਆਂ ਅੰਤ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੁਲਾਣਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਕਹਿਣ ਤੇ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਨੇ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੂੰ ਪੁੱਛਿਆ ਕਿ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਗ੍ਰੰਥ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਿੱਟੀ ਮੁਸਲਮਾਨ ਕੀ ਪੀੜੇ ਪਈ ਕੁਮਿਆਰ ਲਿਖ ਕੇ ਇਸਲਾਮ ਧਰਮ ਦੀ ਨਿੰਦਾ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਹੈ ਬਾਦਸ਼ਾਹ ਉੱਤੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਬਣਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਭਾਵ ਕਾਇਮ ਰੱਖਣ ਲਈ ਅਤੇ ਉਸ ਦੀ ਖੁਸ਼ੀ ਪ੍ਰਾਪਤ ਕਰਨ ਲਈ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਅਸਲ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਮਿੱਟੀ ਬੇਈਮਾਨ ਕੀ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਲਖਾਰੀ ਦੀ ਗਲਤੀ ਕਾਰਨ ਮੁਸਲਮਾਨ ਲਿਖਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਹੈ ਜਦ ਇਸ ਗੱਲ ਬਾਰੇ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰ ਰਾਏ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਲੱਗਾ ਤਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਪੁੱਤਰ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਤੋਂ ਵਾਂਝਾ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਅਤੇ ਸਦਾ ਲਈ ਤਿਆਗ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰ ਰਾਏ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਛੋਟੇ ਪੁੱਤਰ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਹਰ ਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਛੇ ਕਤਕ ਸੰਮਤ 1718 ਨੂੰ ਯੋਗਤਾ ਦੇ ਆਧਾਰ ਤੇ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਬਖਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਵਿਰੋਧਤਾ ਜਾਰੀ ਰੱਖੀ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਦੀ ਬਖਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀਰਤਪੁਰ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਵਿਖੇ ਪਹਿਲੇ ਗੁਰੂਆਂ ਦੀ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਧਰਮ ਦਾ ਪ੍ਰਚਾਰ ਕਰਦੇ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਉਪਦੇਸ਼ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਦੂਰ ਦੂਰ ਤੋਂ ਸੰਗਤਾਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਦਰਸ਼ਨ ਕਰਨ ਲਈ ਆਉਂਦੀਆਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਾਮ ਸਿਮਰਨ ਦੀ ਦਾਤ ਦੇ ਕੇ ਸਿੱਧੇ ਰਸਤੇ ਪਾਉਂਦੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਭਰਾ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੇ ਬਾਦਸ਼ਾਹ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਕੋਲ ਫਰਿਆਦ ਕੀਤੀ ਕਿ ਮੇਰੇ ਪਿਤਾ ਨੇ ਮੇਰਾ ਹੱਕ ਮਾਰ ਕੇ ਮੇਰੇ ਛੋਟੇ ਭਰਾ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਦੇ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਅਤੇ ਜਾਇਦਾਦ ਦੇ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਸਭ ਕੁਝ ਤਾਂ ਹੋਇਆ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਹੁਕਮ ਮੰਨਦਾ ਹਾਂ ਇਹ ਸੁਣ ਕੇ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਨੇ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੈ ਸਿੰਘ ਨੂੰ ਹੁਕਮ ਕੀਤਾ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੂੰ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਬੁਲਾਉਣ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੈ ਸਿੰਘ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਦੀਵਾਨ ਪਰਸ਼ਰਾਮ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਸਤਕਾਰ ਸਹਿਤ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਲਿਆਉਣ ਲਈ ਭੇਜਿਆ ਦੀਵਾਨ ਨੇ ਕੀਰਤਪੁਰ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੂੰ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਜਾਣ ਲਈ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਕੀਤੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ
ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਉਸ ਦੇ ਸਿਰ ਤੇ ਸੋਟੀ ਰੱਖ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਅਤੇ ਨੇਤਰਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਨੇਤਰ ਪਾਏ ਪੰਡਤ ਨੇ ਛੱਜੂ ਤੋਂ ਗੀਤਾ ਦੇ ਔਖੇ ਤੋਂ ਔਖੇ ਸ਼ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਅਰਥ ਪੁੱਛੇ ਜਿਸ ਦੇ ਤੁਰੰਤ ਉਸ ਨੇ ਅਰਥ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਪੰਡਤ ਇਹ ਕੌਤਕ ਵੇਖ ਕੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਚਰਨੀ ਪੈ ਕੇ ਮਾਫੀ ਮੰਗਣ ਲੱਗਾ ਉਹ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਸਿੱਖ ਬਣ ਗਿਆ ਅਤੇ ਇਸ ਇਲਾਕੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖੀ ਦਾ ਪ੍ਰਚਾਰ ਕਰਨ ਲੱਗਾ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਪਹੁੰਚ ਕੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੈ ਸਿੰਘ ਦੇ ਬੰਗਲੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਠਹਿਰੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਗੁਰਦੁਆਰਾ ਬੰਗਲਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਸਥਿਤ ਹੈ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਨੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਦਰਸ਼ਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਇੱਛਾ ਪ੍ਰਗਟ ਕੀਤੀ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਪਿਤਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਰਾਜ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਆਦੇਸ਼ ਅਨੁਸਾਰ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਨੂੰ ਦਰਸ਼ਨ ਦੇਣ ਤੋਂ ਇਨਕਾਰ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਪੁੱਤਰ ਸ਼ਹਿਜ਼ਾਦਾ ਮੁਅੱਜ਼ਮ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੋਲ ਭੇਜਿਆ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਆਤਮਿਕ ਉਪਦੇਸ਼ ਦੇ ਕੇ ਨਿਹਾਲ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਦ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਨਾ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਜਾਣ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਤੁਰੀ ਤਾਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਸਪਸ਼ਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਵਿਰਾਸਤ ਜਾਂ ਜੱਦੀ ਮਲਕੀਅਤ ਨਹੀਂ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਨੇ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਦੀ ਤੁਕ ਬਦਲੀ ਇਸ ਤੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਪਿਤਾ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਤਿਆਗ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਰਾਮ ਰਾਏ ਦਾ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਬਾਰੇ ਦਾਵਾ ਝੂਠਾ ਹੈ ਸ਼ਹਿਜ਼ਾਦਾ ਮੁਅੱਜ਼ਮ ਤੋਂ ਇਹ ਸਪਸ਼ਟੀਕਰਨ ਸੁਣ ਕੇ ਔਰੰਗਜ਼ੇਬ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਸਿਆਣਪ ਦਾ ਕਾਇਲ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਉਸ ਨੇ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੈ ਸਿੰਘ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਕਰਾਮਾਤੀ ਸ਼ਕਤੀ ਪਰਖਣ ਲਈ ਕਿਹਾ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੈ ਸਿੰਘ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੀ ਰਾਣੀ ਦੇ ਮਹਿਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਲੈ ਗਿਆ ਰਾਣੀ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਗੋਲੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਰਗੇ ਵਧੀਆਂ ਪੁਸ਼ਾਕਾਂ ਪਹਿਨਾ ਦਿੱਤੀਆਂ ਅਤੇ ਆਪ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੈਠ ਗਈ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਜੀ ਸਭ ਗੋਲੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਛੱਡ ਕੇ ਰਾਣੀ ਦੀ ਗੋਦ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾ ਬੈਠ ਗਏ ਇਸ ਘਟਨਾ ਨਾਲ ਗੁਰੂ ਘਰ ਦੀ ਸ਼ੋਭਾ ਹੋਰ ਵੱਧ ਗਈ ਜਦੋਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਸਨ ਤਾਂ ਉੱਥੇ ਬੁਖਾਰ ਅਤੇ ਚੇਚਕ ਦੀ ਬਿਮਾਰੀ ਫੈਲੀ ਹੋਈ ਸੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਦੁਖੀਆਂ ਅਤੇ ਬਿਮਾਰਾਂ ਦੀ ਦਿਨ ਰਾਤ ਸਹਾਇਤਾ ਕੀਤੀ ਸੰਗਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਦਸਵੰਦ ਅਤੇ ਭੇਟਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਸ ਸੇਵਾ ਲਈ ਵਰਤਿਆ ਰੋਗੀਆਂ ਦੀ ਸੇਵਾ ਕਰਦਿਆਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਤੇਜ ਬੁਖਾਰ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਰੀਰ ਉੱਤੇ ਵੀ ਚੇਚਕ ਦੇ ਲੱਛਣ ਦਿਸਣ ਲੱਗ ਪਏ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਅੰਤ ਸਮਾਂ ਨੇੜੇ ਜਾਣ ਕੇ ਸੰਗਤਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਰਿਆਈ ਬਾਰੇ ਹੁਕਮ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਅਤੇ ਬਾਬਾ ਬਕਾਲੇ ਜਿਸ ਦਾ ਭਾਵ ਕਿ ਅਗਲਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਪਿੰਡ ਬਕਾਲੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੈ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਤਿੰਨ ਵਿਸਾਖ ਸੰਮਤ 1721 ਨੂੰ ਜੋਤੀ ਜੋਤ ਸਮਾ ਗਏ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਪਵਿੱਤਰ ਸਰੀਰ ਦਾ ਸੰਸਕਾਰ ਜਮਨਾ ਨਦੀ ਦੇ ਕਿਨਾਰੇ ਤੇ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਜਿਸ ਥਾਂ ਤੇ ਹੁਣ ਬਾਲ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਗੁਰਦੁਆਰਾ ਸ਼ੋਭਿਤ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਸੀ ਸੰਖੇਪ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਹਰਿਕ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਜੀਵਨ ਦਾ ਅਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਜੋਤੀ ਜੋਤ ਦਿਵਸ ਦਾ ਸੰਗਤ ਜੀ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਬੋਲਦਿਆਂ ਜੇਕਰ ਕਿਸੇ ਵੀ ਪ੍ਰਕਾਰ ਦੀ ਭੁੱਲ ਚੁੱਕ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਹੋਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਆਪ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਮਾਫੀ ਬਖਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਨੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਆਪ ਮੇ ਸੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਸੇ ਲੋਗੋ ਕੋ ਪਤਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖ ਧਰਮ ਮੇ ਹਰੇਕ ਗੁਰੂ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਸ਼ਿਸ਼ਯ ਦੀ ਸੇਵਾ ਭਗਤੀ ਦੇਖ ਕਰ ਉਸੇ ਖੁਸ਼ ਹੋ ਕਰ ਉਹਨੇ ਗੁਰਗੱਦੀ ਸੌਂਪ ਕਰ ਸਿੱਖੋਂ ਦਾ ਅਗਲਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਬਣਾਇਆ ਪਰ ਉਹ ਸਭੀ ਸਿੱਖ ਗੁਰੂਆਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਸੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਤੇਗ ਬਹਾਦਰ ਜੀ ਇੱਕ ਐਸੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਹੋਏ ਹਨ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਗੁਰਗੱਦੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਪੋਤੇ ਸੇ
तथा घुड़सवारी भी सीखी आप जी को तलवार चलाने में महारत हासिल थी यह बात तब सिद्ध होती है जब 14 वर्ष की उम्र होने पर बालक त्याग मल ने अपने पिता के साथ पेंदे खां के विरुद्ध करतारपुर पंजाब में जंग लड़ी थी उस समय बालक त्याग मल ने तलवार के ऐसे जौहर दिखाए कि दुश्मन उनके सामने टिक न सके इससे प्रसन्न होकर गुरु पिता हरगोबिंद साहिब जी ने आपका नाम त्यागमल से तेग बहादुर रख दिया श्री गुरु तेग बहादुर जी का स्वभाव बचपन से ही बड़ा कोमल और सहनशील था वे किसी का भी दुख सहन न कर पाते एक बार किसी गरीब जरूरतमंद व्यक्ति को पैसों की जरूरत थी गुरु जी तब अपने घर से सामान लाकर उसे दे आए जब आपके माता जी ने इस बात का कारण पूछा तब आपने बड़े सहज स्वभाव कह दिया माता जी हमें ऐसे सामान का क्या करना जो हमारे लिए इतना जरूरी नहीं है पर उस गरीब के किसी काम अवश्य आ सकता है इतिहास में दर्ज है कि आपके बड़े भाई गुरुदत्ता जी के विवाह के समय बालक तेग बहादुर जी को बेश कीमती पोशाक सोने के कड़े और हार पहनाए गए जब बारात चलने लगी तो आप जी की नजर एक भूखे नंगे गरीब बच्चे पर पड़ी आप उसको इस अवस्था में देखकर इतने दुखी हुए कि दौड़कर उसे अपने कपड़े और गहने दे आए आपके पिता तब बहुत खुश हुए इन सभी घटनाओं से यह सिद्ध होता है कि आप बड़े ही दयालु थे बालक तेग बहादुर जी के दूसरे बड़े भाई बाबा अटल राय जी थे जो आपसे केवल दो साल बड़े थे हम उम्र होने से दोनों भाइयों में बहुत प्यार था एक बार की बात है बाबा अटल राय जी और बालक तेग बहादुर जी बचपन में अपने साथियों के साथ आंख में चोनी खेल रहे थे ढूंढने की जिस बालक की बारी आती तो उसे अपनी बारी देनी पड़ती थी अंधेरा हो जाने पर खेल बंद करना पड़ा पर ढूंढने की बारी एक मोहन नामक बालक की थी अगले दिन वही खेल शुरू किया गया पर मोहन खेलने ना आया सभी बच्चों को लगा कि मोहन अपनी बारी से बचने के लिए खेलने नहीं आया होगा तब बाबा अटल राय जी और बालक तेग बहादुर जी सभी बच्चों के साथ मोहन के घर पहुंचे वहां जाकर उनके घर वालों को रोता देख पता चला कि मोहन की सांप के डसने से मृत्यु हो चुकी है उस समय बाबा अटल राय जी ने सह स्वभाव कह दिया नहीं वह मरा नहीं है बल्कि वह मरने का नाटक कर रहा है क्योंकि उसकी अब ढूंढने की बारी है जिससे वह बच रहा है इतना कहकर बाबा अटल राय जी मोहन के पास गए और अपनी छड़ी के साथ मोहन को जोर से हिलाते हुए बोले बारी तो तुझे खेलनी ही होगी अब उठकर खड़ा हो जा कहते हैं तब एक चमत्कार हुआ बाबा जी की छड़ी लगते ही मोहन उठकर बैठ गया तब सारे बच्चे मोहन को लेकर खेलने चले गए पर मोहन के माँ बाप इस चमत्कार को देखकर हैरान रह गए क्योंकि वे अच्छी तरह जानते थे कि मोहन को मरे हुए काफी घंटों बीत चुके थे और बाबा अटल राय जी ने मोहन को अपनी शक्ति से दोबारा जीवन दान दिया है धीरे धीरे यह खबर पिता हरगोबिंद साहिब जी तक पहुँच गयी वे ऐसा सुनकर बिल्कुल प्रसन्न ना हुए क्योंकि वे जानते थे कि उनके पुत्र बाबा अटल राय हर प्रकार की करामातों के मालिक हैं और अगर सभी लोगों को उनकी यह खबर पता चल गई तो सब अपने घर वालों का मृत शरीर उठाकर बाबा अटल राय जी के पास जिंदा करवाने के लिए भविष्य में ले आया करेंगे तब पिता ने अपने पुत्र बाबा अटल राय को अपने पास बुलवा कहा बेटा तूने आज प्रभु की रजा के विरुद्ध काम किया है यह काम तो प्रभु का है कि किसी को मारे या किसी को जिंदा करे तुमने यह काम करके अच्छा नहीं किया प्रभु ऐसी करामातों से कभी खुश नहीं होता हमेशा सतगुरुओं ने संगतों को यही उपदेश दिया है कि ईश्वर की रजा में रहकर हर कार्य करना चाहिए पर तुमने उस प्रभु की मर्जी के खिलाफ ही काम कर दिया इतने वचन सुनकर बाबा अटल राय जी शर्मसार होकर वहां से चले गए उन्होंने कोलसर सरोवर के पास समाधि लगाकर अपने प्राण त्याग दिए गुरु पिता हर गोबिंद साहिब जी ने अपने हाथों बाबा अटल राय जी का संस्कार किया सारे संगतों को धीरज देकर कहने लगे मनुष्य की जिंदगी और मौत प्रभु के हाथों में है उसकी रजा में ही सब कुछ होता है 
इसलिए हमें किसी के जन्म के समय ना खुश होना चाहिए और ना ही मौत के समय दुखी होना चाहिए बालक तेग बहादुर जी उस समय वही मौजूद थे बचपन में इस घटना का उनके कोमल मन पर इतना गहरा प्रभाव पड़ा कि उन्होंने दृढ़ संकल्प कर लिया कि मनुष्यों को दुखों व सुखों से ऊपर उठना चाहिए यही कारण था कि गुरु तेग बहादुर जी सारी जिंदगी अडोल रहे और कभी किसी का दिल नहीं दुखाया गुरु तेग बहादुर जी के जीवन में एक और अनोखी घटना घटी बाबा गुरदत्ता जी बालक तेग बहादुर जी के सबसे बड़े भाई थे वे अक्सर शिकार खेलने जाया करते थे कहते हैं एक बार अपने साथियों के साथ शिकार खेलने गए तब उनके साथी द्वारा एक गाय का गलती से शिकार हो गया जिससे गाय की मौत हो गई। गांव वाले इकट्ठे हो गए गाय का मालिक भी वहां आ पहुंचा। अपनी मरी हुई गाय को देखकर वह तड़प उठा वह बहुत गरीब था और जोर जोर से रोने लगा इस तरह सभी लोग बाबा गुरदिता जी के पास गाय को जीवित करने की बहुत विनती करने लगे उनकी बात मानकर उन्होंने गाय को जीवित कर दिया उनके पिता हर गोबिंद साहिब जी को जब पता चला तो उन्होंने इस बात की घोर निंदा की तब बाबा गुरदत्ता जी ने प्रायश्चित करने के लिए अपने भाई बाबा अटल राय जी की तरह ही समाधि में लीन होकर अपने प्राण त्याग दिए इन सब घटनाओं को देखकर गुरु तेग बहादुर जी के मन पर बहुत गहरा असर पड़ा गुरु हरगोबिंद साहिब जी के सबसे बड़े पुत्र बाबा गुरदत्ता जी थे उनमें वे सारे गुण थे जो एक गुरु बनने के लिए जरूरी थे पर उनकी अकाल मृत्यु होने के कारण बाबा गुरदत्ता जी के पुत्र हर राय जी यानी गुरु हरगोबिंद साहिब जी के पोते हर राय जी को 19 मार्च सन सोलह ईस्वी को सिखों का सातवा गुरु बना दिया गया गुरु तेग बहादुर जी इतने शांत स्वभाव के थे कि उन्होंने गुरगद्दी पर अपना दावा न किया और अपने पिता को इस बात के लिए कुछ ना कहा उस समय माता नानकी जी ने अपने पति गुरु हरगोबिंद साहिब जी से विनम्र विनती करते हुए कहा आपने हमारे पुत्र तेग बहादुर जी को गुरगद्दी ना सौंप अपने पोते को क्यों दी तब गुरु जी ने उन्हें समझाते हुए कहा कि अब मेरा शरीर त्यागने का समय आ पहुंचा है और तुम इसके बाद परिवार समेत बाबा बकाले अपने मायके जाकर बस जाना सही समय आने पर हमारे पुत्र तेग बहादुर को गुरगद्दी स्वयं ही प्राप्त हो जाएगी सन सोलह को गुरु हरगोबिंद साहिब जी अकाल चलाना कर गए और गुरु जी का सारा परिवार गांव बकाला आकर रहने लगा उस समय गुरु तेग बहादुर जी का विवाह माता गुजरी जी के साथ हो चुका था गांव बकाला में रहते हुए गुरु तेग बहादुर जी ने 26 साल से भी अधिक समय तक एक छोटे से कमरे में एकांत स्थान पर बैठकर कठिन तपस्या की उसी समय के दौरान कीरतपुर में गुरु हर राय जी ज्योति ज्योत समाने से ठीक पहले अपने पांच वर्षीय पुत्र हर कृष्ण जी को सिखों का आठवां गुरु घोषित कर दिया पर गुरु हर कृष्ण जी का जीवन काल बहुत कम समय का था इतिहास में दर्ज है गुरु हर कृष्ण साहिब जी दिल्ली में फैले चेचक की बीमारी से ग्रस्त रोगियों का इलाज करते करते एक दिन खुद भी इस बीमारी से ग्रसित हो गए जब उनकी उम्र मात्र आठ वर्ष थी तब उन्होंने अपना आखिरी समय आता देख संतों से वचन किया कि बाबा बसे जे ग्राम बकाले बनगुर संगत सकल संभाले जिसे सुनते ही संगत समझ गई कि गुरु नानक देव जी की गद्दी के अगले वारिस यानी अगले गुरु गांव बकाला में रहते हैं जो सिखों के नौवे गुरु बनकर सारी संगत किया करेंगे कहते हैं तब ये खबर आग की तरह फैल गई इस मौके का फायदा उठाते हुए कुछ ढोंगी बाबे 22 गदियां लगाकर खुद गुरु बनकर बाबा बकाला में बैठ गए ये नजारा देखकर सिख संगतें दुविधा में पड़ गई कि असली गुरु आखिर कौन है कहते हैं तब एक मक्खन शाह लुभाना नाम का व्यापारी था जो अक्सर व्यापार के सिलसिले में विदेश जाया करता था एक पर वह जहाज से पानी के रास्ते माल लाद कर आ रहा था तब समुद्र में भयंकर तूफान आने लगा जिससे जहाज डूबने लगा वह इतना घबरा गया 
कि उसने गुरु जी को याद किया और विनती की हे गुरुदेव मैं गुरु घर का सेवक हूँ यह जहाज किसी तरह भी किनारे पर पार लगा दे मेरी इच्छा पूरी होने पर मैं आपको 500 सोने की मोहरें भेंट करूंगा मक्खन शाह की अरदास जब अंतर्यामी गुरु तेग बहादुर जी ने सुनी तो उसका डूबता जहाज पार लगाकर उसकी रक्षा की मक्खन शाह तब गुरु जी को अपनी मनोत की 500 सौ मोहरे भेंट करने के लिए पंजाब पहुंचा जहां उसे पता चला कि सिखों के होने वाले नौवे गुरु गांव बकाला में रहते हैं मक्खन शाह गुरु जी को ढूंढने बकाला गांव में पहुंच गया पर वहां का नजारा देखकर दुविधा में पड़ गया क्योंकि वहां ढेरों झूठे लोग गुरु का चोला पहनकर अपने को बकाला वाला गुरु कहलवा रहे थे तब मक्खन शाह ने सोच समझ कर विचार किया कि असली गुरु ही जानता है कि मैंने 500 सोने की मोहरे उन्हें भेंट करनी है इसलिए मक्खन शाह ने सभी गुरुओं के आगे दो दो मोहरे रखकर माथा टेका परंतु किसी ने भी उससे अपनी बाकी मोहरे ना मांगी वे जल्दी ही समझ गया कि ये सब झूठे और पखंडी गुरु बनकर बैठे हैं तब वे सच्चे गुरु की तलाश में आखिर गुरु तेग बहादुर जी के पास पहुंच गया गुरु जी के आगे दो मोहरे रखकर उसने माथा टेका तब गुरु जी ने मोहरे देखकर हंसते हुए कहा मक्खन शाह तो 500 सोने के मोहरे गुरु घर की मन्नत मांगकर अब सिर्फ दो ही मोहरे दे रहा है तुम्हें गुरु घर की पूरी मनोद देनी चाहिए गुरु तेग बहादुर जी के मुख से ऐसे वचन सुनकर उसे पूरा विश्वास हो गया कि यही असली गुरु हैं जो गुरु नानक देव जी की नौवी जोत है वे खुशी से बाग बाग हो उठा एक भी पल गवाए बिना उसने गुरु जी के आगे 500 मोहरे रखकर माथा टेका तब उसने अपनी इस खुशी को सारे जहान को बताने के लिए छत पर चढ़ गया अपने हाथों में कपड़ा लहराकर जोर जोर से चिल्लाने लगा गुरु लाधो रे गुरु लाधो रे इस तरह उसने सभी लोगों में सच्चे गुरु को प्रकट कर दिया गुरु तेग बहादुर जी को सिखों का नौवा गुरु बना दिया गया गुरु जी के जीवन से संबंधित सारी घटनाओं को सुनकर यह पता चलता है कि हर चीज सही समय पर प्राप्त होती है जब सच्चा गुरु प्रकट हुआ तब सभी झूठे और पाखंडियों का पल भर में सफाया हो गया और इस प्रकार सत्य की जीत हुई गुरु तेग बहादुर जी की भक्ति गांव बकाला में पूरी हुई थी तभी से यह स्थान बाबा बकाला के नाम से जाना जाने लगा बाबा बकाले की उसी स्थान पर आजकल बाबा बकाला नामक बहुत सुंदर गुरुद्वारा स्थापित है वाहे गुरु जी का खालसा वाहे गुरु जी की फतेह We at Base of Sikhi strive to inspire and educate you guys about the amazing teachings of Sikhi. Over the past few months, we've made great strides in the work that we have done, and we're excited to share our achievements with you guys. We have built a team of over 40 volunteers across the UK, which has rejuvenated our grassroots Sikhi Parichar. This includes a Japji Sahib course with four new English speakers and two Wahguru courses being carried out across two different cities. We are excited to announce our second full-time Padachadik in the UK, Gurdjieff Jaran Singh, who is also a very talented video editor and has been instrumental in our recent growth. Our short clips and reels discussing spirituality and current Pantic issues have reached over four million views in the past few months. Four million views. We have also released captivating Sikh animations on the stories of Diwali and the Shahidi of Guru Arjan Dev Ji. and guru teg bahadur ji we have more exciting animations coming for you guys on the sakhi and what is sikhi also on our second youtube channel bos tv we released our recent vlogs on our time in india we have the gurumuk series podcast and our interviews with various guru sikhs but we're not stopping there we're planning on creating new and exciting picture books featuring 100 stories on our 10 gurus also we have more vlogs podcast a street prachar coming on a new and exciting antique aversion series focusing on targeted grooming on the Sikh community none of this would be possible without the support of you all today we are asking for your help 
to raise funds for new cutting edge editing equipment to enable us to continue to create inspiring content, reach more people and spread the message of Sikhi to the entire world. Please donate for the Just Give a link found in the description below. And remember, no amount is too small and every contribution makes a difference. Thank you for your ongoing support and generosity. Stay tuned for more exciting content from Bases of Sikhi and may Wai Guruji bless you all. Wai Guruji ka khalsa, Wai Guruji ki fateh. This Christian holiday commemorates the execution of Jesus Christ. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be learning more about Good Friday. Good Friday is a religious holiday observed annually by Christians to remember the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Its actual date varies from year to year, as it is based on when Jewish Passover takes place. As the date of Passover is dependent on the Jewish lunisolar calendar, Good Friday falls between March 20th and April 23rd each year. Easter, which celebrates Jesus Christ's resurrection following his crucifixion, always falls on the Sunday two days later. As written in the New Testament of the Bible, Jesus' Last Supper was a Passover meal which he shared with his apostles. This is when the washing of the feet took place and when Jesus first presented the Christian rite of the Eucharist, which is now practiced as the Holy Communion. Christians celebrate this day as Maundy or Holy Thursday. It is believed that Jesus was betrayed by his disciple Judas shortly after the Last Supper. Because of this, he was arrested by temple guards in the Garden of Gethsemane and crucified by Pontius Pilate over accusations that he claimed to be the Son of God. Though Christians now believe Jesus is the Son of God and their Messiah, the high priests and people of his time believed this was blasphemy that deserved a death sentence. Scholars have estimated that the crucifixion took place on a Friday in the year 33 AD and Jesus remained on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The whole of his sentencing and suffering is known as the Passion of Christ. Good Friday is part of the three days in the Easter Triduum, which is a liturgical period that incorporates Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. It is of particular importance in the Roman Catholic tradition. When it comes to food, Catholics will only consume one big meal and two small meals while refraining from meat. They also may perform prayers or acts of reparation, devotions to the Station of the Cross in the name of the Passion, and attend prayer services. On the other hand, a complete fast during all of this Holy and Great Friday is observed in the Eastern or Byzantine tradition. Meanwhile, a three-hour service commemorating the Passion may be held in Anglican, Lutheran, and Eastern Orthodox churches. Many countries with a Christian background have made Good Friday a public holiday, with several highly Catholic countries holding Good Friday processions. Devotees sometimes travel to Rome to share in the Pope's prayers. The day after Good Friday is the last day of Holy Week, Holy Saturday. It marks the end of Lent, which is a time for fasting, self-denial, and the repentance of sins. It also symbolizes the period between Jesus' death when Joseph of Arimathea wrapped his body and laid it to rest in a tomb and his resurrection. It was only the next day, on Easter Sunday, that female visitors discovered his empty tomb and that he had risen from the dead. For more great historical videos, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, and welcome to Ask a Marian. Sammy in Oshawa, Ontario asks, Father, why is there no Mass on Good Friday? Why did the Romans break the legs of those crucified on the cross? And can we say God died on the cross? In addition, we are told that Jesus descended into hell. Why, if nobody can be released from hell? Well, Sammy, that is a loaded question. <laughs> And I'm not sure if I can get all of it in, but I'm going to try. So we are ready right now. We are entering into the most holy 11 days of the entire year. Yes, the three-day triduum and the eight-day Easter octave are full of grace. But let's focus today right now on the triduum. All right. The Easter triduum holds a special place in the liturgical year because it marks the culmination of proclaiming the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. The Latin word triduum refers to a period of three days, any three days actually, 
that prepares for a great feast through liturgy, prayer, and fasting. But it is most often used to describe those three days prior to Easter. So, it begins with Holy Thursday, includes Good Friday and Holy Saturday with the Easter Vigil. Now, it begins with that evening Mass on the Lord's Supper. That's the Holy Thursday evening. And reaches its high point on the Easter Vigil and then ends or concludes with evening prayer on Easter Sunday. Did you get all that? Okay, so let's back up. Sometimes before the Mass of our Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday, the bishop in each diocese will celebrate a chrism Mass where the oil that's used in baptisms, confirmations, anointings, that's all blessed. And the focus is also on the ordained priesthood with the priest renewing publicly their promises to fulfill their duties. So it's a big day. Now, in the evening at the Liturgy of the Lord's Supper on Thursday, the priest who is in Persona Christi may wash the feet of several parishioners, such as the catechumens who will be entering into the church at the Easter Vigil on Saturday. Now, traditionally, this has been 12 men to represent the 12 apostles, but that's a topic for another time. <laughs> so, Holy Thursday is when Christ instituted the priesthood at the Last Supper. How do we know this? There's many reasons. The Eucharist, of course, but also one people don't know is washing the feet in the book of Exodus was part of the ordination ceremony for the Aaronic priesthood. And now Jesus is ordaining the apostles as the first priests. All right, so a lot going on. Now, let's take a look at Good Friday. Why isn't there a mass on this day? Well, because the mass is a representation of the sacrifice on Calvary. But on this day, Good Friday, we remember the reality, not just the representation. So we don't consecrate the sacrament on that day because this is the day the event actually happens. Um, in this way, we remember the reality of Jesus's passion without having to celebrate a representation of it. So amazing. Now, we but we, we do have a liturgy though on the Lord's passion, this being Good Friday, at usually 3 p.m., which consists of three parts, the Liturgy of the Word, Veneration of the Cross, and we do receive Holy Communion. Although, as I said, it's not a Mass and there's no consecration. Obviously, this is an extremely holy day where we pray, fast, and abstain from meat to unite ourselves with the cross of Christ, who died in our place, as you know, to pay our debt for sin, which is death, so that we can live. Now, to answer the question, why did they break the legs of those who were on the cross? Well, remember, they didn't break Jesus' legs, although they were going to, because then he would not be the unblemished lamb. They did it so that those who were being crucified uh, couldn't lift themselves up with their legs to take a breath as they were being asphyxiated during the crucifixion. So this would enable them to die sooner. Wow, a, a very somber thought, um, but one that we should reflect on, you know, meditate on our Lord's passion. <clears throat> All right, what about Jesus quoting Psalm 22? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God the Father forsake Jesus? Okay, God the Father did not abandon his son in his son's suffering, but allowed him <clears throat> in his humanity to experience the sense of divine abandonment that we humans often feel during times of need, and especially when we are in sin. So, just as we often feel that God has abandoned us when we are suffering, even though that's not the case, so the Son of God in his humanity experienced that aspect of human suffering as well. And by quoting the psalm, though, we should keep in mind that Jesus shows that he is the fulfillment of that prophecy, and he will be vindicated because that psalm actually has a triumphant ending. All right, did God die on the cross? All this going on, she asks, or Sammy asks, if, if God died on the cross? Yes, we can say that. Now, the divine nature can't die and did not die, but Jesus of Nazareth 
did die. And Jesus, Jesus also is the Son of God. So we can say that God died on the cross in that sense. So, summary here. We, we have no Mass on Good Friday, and we should, if possible, continue our Paschal fast in preparation of Easter. So, let's go to Friday night now. After Good Friday celebration of the Passion, we go to the Tenebrae service many times, which usually features the seven last words of Christ on the cross or gospel readings from the Passion. Now we have Holy Saturday. When is this? Okay, Holy Saturday, again, has no Mass until after sundown. That's when Christians would hold an all-night vigil. We call it the Easter Vigil, the biggest celebration. And it would conclude usually with baptism, confirmation, and Holy Communion at the break of dawn. So, to summarize, the Triduum is so holy that it's its own liturgical season between Lent and Easter. Although we traditionally keep our Lenten observances all the way through the Easter Vigil of the Triduum. Now, let's talk about Easter. Easter is not based on a pagan holiday, but on a Jewish one called Passover. Easter originated as the first Sunday following Passover when, of course, Jesus resurrected. That's why we say keep holy the Lord's Day, no longer the Sabbath, because we're talking Sunday. In virtually every language, Easter is derived from the Jewish word Pesach, or Passover. And in Latin, the term is Pascha, from which we get the Paschal mystery. So, Scripture says Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, which was Sunday to the Jews. Now, here's what's interesting. <clears throat> it means that he rose on the day that began at sunset on Saturday and lasted until sunset on Sunday. Remember, for the Jews, days began the evening the night before. So when you get to sundown, it's actually the next day for the Jews. This is very important. Since we are told his tomb was found empty, Jesus' tomb was found empty, quote, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, he must have risen sometime between sunset Saturday and dawn on Sunday. So, technically, he may have even risen Saturday night. This surprises people. But that still counts as Sunday on the Jewish calendar. <laughs> Are you getting all this? I hope so. Which begins at sunset. Because remember, Jesus raised on Sunday, but that actually could begin at sunset the night before. Each day for the Jews began at sunset the night before, not at midnight like for us. All right. Whether the resurrection was before or after midnight, Scripture doesn't say. So, that is why we can celebrate the Easter Vigil on Saturday night. I always wondered that. Why are we celebrating on Saturday night? He hasn't resurrected yet. Interesting point, right? So, keep in mind, a day and a night to the Jews does not mean a period of 24 hours. All right. It can refer to any portion of a day coupled with any portion of a night. So three days and three nights for Jesus could mean even a small part of a day or a night. Now, if Jesus was crucified and died Friday afternoon, think about this, that would be the first day. Then at sundown on Friday, that would begin the second day. Then at sundown on Saturday, we would begin the third day. So Jesus was indeed raised on the third day, as Matthew tells us. Now, before that, it says he descended into hell, but this was not the hell of the damned. This was Sheol or Hades, which is where the righteous went who died before Jesus, awaiting for him to open the doors to heaven. Gehenna is the place of the damned. And once you're there, that is right, Sammy, you can't get out. So. <clears throat> This is not what we're talking about. We are talking about the righteous waiting to be released. So the Triduum chronologically is three days and liturgically, however, one day, unfolding for us in the unity of Christ's Paschal mystery. Then the next eight days are also celebrated as one day, Easter Sunday leading to Divine Mercy Sunday, which is actually the high point 
of the eight days, but that is a topic for next week. I already gave you enough this week. We'll discuss that one next week. Praise be to God for you all hanging in there with me. I know it was long, but the graces are many. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a National Geographic Channel special presentation. It is one of Christianity's greatest mysteries. Was Jesus resurrected from the dead? Fact of faith or miraculous fiction? The apostles struggled with the same issue, and today we still find ourselves in search of Easter. Two thousand years ago, three words uttered in a backwater of the ancient world shook the Roman Empire. Three words ignited a global religious movement that changed the course of history. Three words defined a faith and continue to grip millions. He has risen. Jesus' triumph over death three days after his agonizing end on the cross is Christianity's defining belief, a mysterious and pivotal moment in time, now celebrated as the miracle of Easter. I believe that the resurrection of Jesus is going to remain one of the most impenetrable mysteries in human history. Not because those of us who accept that there was a resurrection don't believe that something happened, but it's because of our inability to be absolutely precise about what happened. We are dealing with an event that quite simply is outside of normal human comprehension. Did Jesus truly rise from the dead? What really happened 2,000 years ago? What series of events led to a worldwide belief in the resurrection and lit the flame of Christian faith? Scholars in search of answers look to the New Testament, our only source of the resurrection narrative. The story is chronicled in its first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, known as the Gospels, or Good News. For many, the search for the truth also leads here, to the site where they believe the imponderable miracle of Jesus' resurrection occurred. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre has stood in Jerusalem in one form or another since the fourth century. Inside is a smaller structure enshrining what remains of the reputed tomb of Jesus. No evidence exists that proves the site's validity but visitors appreciate its symbolic, if not historic, value. Since little remains of the original tomb, some find greater satisfaction at a second site in Jerusalem. The so-called garden tomb, though less steeped in tradition, more closely matches the image in the popular imagination. At both locations, visitors can embrace their belief in the risen Jesus. Their conviction is shared by millions. According to a recent Harris poll, 80% of Americans, including non-Christians, believe in the resurrection. This is really quite an extraordinary number, but I don't think that the polls actually get at what the people do believe. 
Do they believe that Jesus survived the dead in spirit form? Do they believe that Jesus was physically lifted up in body form as the Gospels would have it? Or do they take a more metaphorical view of the resurrection that somehow Jesus' message lived on? So the very statement really doesn't tell us exactly what people believe. Since word of the Easter miracle first spread from the Holy Land, the resurrection has meant one thing to some Christians and something else to others. I believe that the resurrection is a fact. It's a fact of faith, not a fact of history. It has nothing to do with an empty tomb or miraculous appearances afterwards. These are beautiful legends that express that Christians believe that Jesus is empowered by God and living in heaven, if you will, but those events never happened. If there were an event at the tomb to be seen, then cameras could have caught it. There'd be no room for faith. We would have reduced faith to history. I have no doubt about the sincerity of people like Peter and James and Paul and Mary Magdalene when they testified that they saw Jesus return to them. They recognized him. As historians, we can locate the sincerity of the person giving the testimony, but we cannot confirm the actual fact of what they did or did not see. We can be historically sure, as sure as anything can be in history, that early Christians had visions of the risen Lord and had it immediately after the execution. Visions of the risen Lord happened. Now, how you explain them, that's a separate issue. But that they happened, I think, is an historical fact. What actually happened two millennia ago? The answer is all the more elusive because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John offer differing accounts. While similar in scope, the stories vary in their details. They do not set out to write history in our sense of the term. Rather, they begin with a certain conviction or belief in who Jesus is. So the gospel stories are intended to interpret the meaning of a mystery rather than report a historical fact. Many people think the gospels are written as straight history, whereas they're written as religious poetry about history. And poetry can tell us a lot more than empirical historical fact because it tells us the personal significance, the meaning of those facts. According to all four Gospels, the events leading to the Easter miracle begin on a distant Friday as darkness falls on Jerusalem. A man of vision is dead. A community of believers devastated. All of the hopes that he had raised with his teachings, all of the hopes about the significance of love, the majesty of compassion, the ability of people to be together in a new way, all of those hopes seem dashed. All four of the gospel authors tell of an aristocrat named Joseph of Arimathea, who is entrusted with the remains of Jesus. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. Matthew's Gospel specifies how Jesus' enemies, Jerusalem's high priests, arranged for guards to be posted outside the tomb's entrance. They suspect the disciples have conspired to steal the body to fabricate his resurrection. Resurrection was a widely held belief among Jews of Jesus' day. Many people believed that God was going to reveal himself, and he was going to reveal his messianic kingdom as his triumph over the oppressive Gentile empires that had ruled the Jews from the Babylonians down to the Romans. And the second expectation was that God was going to rescue those people, especially those who had been martyred 
by the Gentile oppressors. God was going to awaken those martyrs who are asleep and awaken them into his messianic kingdom. Three days after the death of Jesus comes the breathless instant when God reveals he has awakened Jesus from the grave. But each gospel has a slightly different version of this moment. John offers the briefest account. He writes that Mary Magdalene, the most prominent female disciple, discovers that the stone sealing the tomb of Jesus has been rolled away. She is shocked to find that his body is missing. In Mark's version, additional women join Mary, and they also encounter an angel. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Luke's gospel adds another angel to proclaim the resurrection, while Matthew tells of an earthquake which has rolled the stone away. The sentries that only Matthew mentions have been rendered unconscious. One constant in each gospel is that the body of Jesus is missing. What became of it? Did it miraculously dematerialize as Jesus rose from the dead? Or could the solution to the resurrection mystery have nothing to do with the supernatural? On a distant Sunday morning, say the Gospels, the tomb of Jesus lies empty. For believers, it is a sign of God's miraculous rescue of Jesus from death. But if the tomb was truly empty, what became of the corpse? Why didn't the enemies of the early Christians, particularly the Romans who killed him in the first place, simply quash this whole Christian business at the source and simply say, look, here's the body, enough of this nonsense. The fact that they cannot do that, this obvious move, lends an even greater mystery to the events that we see as the resurrection of Jesus. If the body of Jesus was missing from the tomb, is it possible that it was never there in the first place? Probably no one knew where Jesus' body was located. Because he was executed as a common criminal, the chances are he was buried either in a common grave or left for animals to devour. The Roman execution, crucifixion, intended to leave the body there until there was nothing left to be buried. That's what crucifixion meant. It wasn't a question of making you suffer, it was a question of annihilating your identity, not even leaving enough to be buried. That is the awful possibility, that that's what the Romans did to the body of Jesus. History has to do with the exceptions rather than with the norm. That is, Jesus had followers, he had sympathizers, he had people who cared for him. It's far more plausible to me historically that something like the version that Jesus was buried in a tomb by somebody who was sympathetic to him is roughly reliable. Some scholars believe that the gospel's emphasis that it was women who were first on the scene lends the story credibility. If you were to make up this story and to make it more believable, you certainly wouldn't choose the witness of women. Because at the time of Jesus, women's social standing was very low indeed. Women would not have been trusted as the most reliable witnesses. And they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And these words appear to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. According to John's Gospel, only Peter and an unnamed disciple are curious enough to investigate the empty tomb for themselves. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and he went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. 
John's Gospel goes on to report that the amazed Peter and his companion depart the tomb, leaving Mary Magdalene alone to behold the impossible. A man calls her, she turns and sees, she supposes him to be the gardener. And she says, please, sir, tell me where you've taken the body so that I can claim it. And when the man calls her by name, Miriam, she recognizes, in fact, that this is no gardener. This is her resurrected Lord appearing to her in the flesh. John's vivid account offers no physical description of Jesus and no explanation as to why Mary fails at first to recognize him. The way John goes on to tell the story, Mary has what we would take to be a very natural reaction. She wants to grasp and hug Jesus. And Jesus tells Mary, no, not yet. I can't be touched yet. And it's, it lends an interesting and mysterious air to the whole episode. Mary's encounter, according to the Gospels, is only the beginning. Luke describes another sighting that he says occurs later that day. Two of Jesus' followers, who have just witnessed the crucifixion, are traveling on the road to Emmaus, a village north of Jerusalem. They are unaware that their martyred teacher intends to continue their education. The two disciples are walking along disconsolate after the events that have taken place in Jerusalem. And they're discussing what had happened in the city. And as they're walking along, they're joined by a stranger whom they don't recognize and who enters into conversation with them. They're surprised that the stranger had not heard about the death of Jesus. And as they continue to talk and to walk, they describe to this stranger what Jesus had done, what he stood for. And as day began to progress toward night, the stranger announced that he would leave, and the followers say, no, 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 why don't you come and have supper with us? And the stranger agrees. And as they're sitting at supper, the stranger began to explain to them the truth of the story of Jesus, unpacked through the sacred scripture that all Jews held at the time, what Christians today would call the Old Testament. And the stranger gives them almost like a graduate course in the interpretation of scripture, showing them that if they understood their scriptures, they would not have been so surprised that even the Messiah would be executed. Then comes the crucial point of the story. Jesus takes the bread, breaks it, blesses it, and hands it out, the Eucharistic formula, and they recognize Jesus. And it's only as they begin to comprehend the significance of what this stranger has been saying, we have this moment of comprehension when they recognize their former teacher. I think that this is very important. There's a sense in which the Gospels are telling us it's when we recognize the importance of what he taught us that we suddenly recognize him. Luke's account then takes an abrupt twist. At the very moment the two disciples identify Jesus, he suddenly vanishes. The pair rush to Jerusalem to report their encounter to the other disciples. They find them gathered together, still shaken by Jesus' death on the cross. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus' followers were greatly afraid following his crucifixion. They feared that they themselves would be caught by Pilate's army, by Pilate's soldiers, and themselves crucified. They unite in a room, a locked room, in Jerusalem. They're meeting, probably to console one another. So it's a scene of quiet, of fear, of, of some discomfort with the events that have transpired. And without the door opening, the Gospel of John says, Jesus suddenly is amongst them. The Gospel accounts of this breathless encounter make clear that Jesus is instantly recognized. The story will attempt to answer a question as old as Christianity. What type of being was the resurrected Jesus? A locked room in Jerusalem the grief-stricken disciples overwhelmed by the finality of the crucifixion and the shocking appearance of the risen Jesus 
ingredients of one of the gospel's most mesmerizing narratives. The story may hold the key to one of Christianity's greatest mysteries. Was the resurrected Jesus human, spirit, or something else? They were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Jesus appears in an altered fashion, so he's really there, it's really Jesus, and yet he's not there in precisely the same way that he was before. It is spirit and it is body. Okay. And as spirit, it is capable of entering into communication and intimacy with other bodies. The form of Jesus' resurrected body remained an issue of debate within the early church. For some, Jesus is more like a spirit. He walks through walls. He appears and disappears miraculously. And yet for others, he is solid flesh and blood. The Greek here would be sarks, flesh with hair follicles and sweat glands, flesh like you and I are flesh. To proclaim that Jesus is an incarnate and enfleshed Lord suggests that the human body is not some prison or something to be sloughed off, but rather the package that we inhabit, our bodies, are an intrinsic part of us. They cannot be separated from our spirit or from our soul. And why is this important? Because the resurrection of Jesus says, the material and the physical is important. The physical and the material is central to the Christian message. This is not a disembodied movement that cares only for spiritual, ethereal things. It is, one could say, God's endorsement of the made and created world. If the locked room encounter actually occurred, what swirl of emotions flooded the hearts and minds of the disciples? The Gospels are fairly candid about the fact that not all believers are instantly convinced. Luke has a remarkable phrase that his disciples disbelieved because of their joy. It was like it was too good to be believed that Jesus should be among them. In other words, there's a moment where they're, they're still not sure. They're, they're happy with what they think, but they're still not sure. There's an interesting element of this, and that is that in the somberness of dealing with a subject as serious as the resurrection, we can miss occasionally that there is actually some humor involved in this event as well. Let's remember, Jesus was famous for many of his miracles of food, water to wine, multiplying loaves and fishes. Clearly, Jesus loved to eat, and the disciples probably loved to eat with him. There's a moment at the Gospel of Luke where he's describing Jesus' appearance to the disciples. And then Jesus says, let's eat. Where's the fish? I suspect at that moment, some of the disciples of Jesus said, yep, that's him. According to John's gospel, the issue of doubt reaches critical mass when Jesus appears eight days after the encounter in the locked room. Jesus' purpose is to address it head on. Once again, the apostles are gathered in Jerusalem. Among them is a vocal skeptic who was not present at Jesus' first appearance, the disciple Thomas. And when the disciples recount to him that Jesus had appeared to them, Thomas, as we know from later legend, becomes doubting Thomas. He says, I'm not going to believe until I can actually touch the wounds, until not only can I see Jesus, but actually feel him. Thomas wants more proof. Thomas wants a physical experience of Jesus. So, in a sense, John puts Thomas as a stand-in for us. Thomas asks our questions. Thomas expresses our doubts. At which point, Jesus miraculously appears to Thomas and indeed extends an invitation saying, touch here, feel where the spear went in, touch the holes in my hand, feel that I am flesh. Thomas actually is never described as touching Jesus. Rather, it's enough to have the invitation, at which point he announces, my Lord and my God, he now believes. And Jesus tells him that 
you have believed because you have seen. But blessed are those who believe even though they have not seen. And it seems to me that John's Gospel is trying to get at the status of everybody else. That for all those after Jesus' ascension, if you will, the presence of Jesus is always mediated through somebody else. It's not directly. We can't touch Jesus. And that is the reality that we live with in the modern era because we are dependent on reading about the resurrection as well as our sense of God's presence with us in a way that unfortunately is not going to be like Thomas's. Thomas had an advantage over us. The Gospel of John tells us that after Jesus erases Thomas's doubt, he vanishes once again. Why does the resurrected Jesus continue to appear and then disappear? This odd appearing, disappearing of Jesus in the appearance accounts has a very important message. And that is that the resurrection is not resuscitation. Jesus doesn't open an office. He's not there permanently. He's not there in his, his former somatic limitedness. He's a surprising presence. He intrudes, he interrupts. He is not predictable, he is not controllable. And in that sense, he shares the life of the living God. The appearing and disappearing are kind of moving us towards the reality that we are going to live with for the rest of time, and that is that we don't have the physical presence of Jesus anymore with us. We have, as it were, the spiritual presence of Jesus with us. There's a sense in which we're getting used to the fact now that the physical presence of Jesus is no longer going to be accessible to us. Could yet another possibility exist that explains Jesus' sporadic appearances? Is it possible he did not limit his visits to ancient Israel? This is the intriguing scenario described in the Book of Mormon. The book, which emerged in 19th century America, is revered by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as God's holy word. The Book of Mormon is an account of a civilization that lived in the Americas between about 600 years before Jesus was born till about 400 years after he died. The centerpiece of this story is Jesus' appearance to them after he died and was resurrected. He comes to the Americas with business in mind. Jesus will say to these people in the Americas, now I said to the Jews in Palestine, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, and they misunderstood me. They thought I meant the Gentiles, but no, I meant you. I meant you're the other sheep. I must come visit you. I must manifest myself unto you so that you can bear witness to the world about the nature of God and how to receive a forgiveness of sin, or more to the point, how you can overcome the circumstances of the world and be made one with God. According to the Book of Mormon, the risen Jesus remains with America's ancient tribes for three or four days. He then vanishes and makes sporadic appearances for an unspecified period of time. Meanwhile, according to the New Testament, Jesus continues to embrace his disciples in ancient Israel. But perhaps the most puzzling story of all is also the most epic. Did the resurrected Jesus really appear before a gathering of 500 spellbound witnesses? One episode in the New Testament's Easter narrative cries out as perhaps its greatest paradox. Why would Jesus' appearance before the greatest number of people be described in the fewest number of words? In 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul gives a recitation of those who had experienced an appearance of Jesus, he includes a puzzling reference to 500 at one time, some of whom are still around and able to bear testimony to this fact. The most puzzling thing about this is that there's no story about it in the Gospels as such. 
we would think that if there were such an event, it would certainly would be included among the resurrection stories of Jesus or the appearance accounts. Now for Paul, he just sort of mentions this in passing. Now, of course, when we moderns read that, we want to say, stop, wait, back up. What do you mean 500 people? Who were they? What were they? Where were they? When did this happen? And we're terribly frustrated about the fact that Paul just sort of mentions it in passing. Clearly, his concerns were elsewhere. He was already arriving at the issue of what does all this mean, not did it actually happen? Is the resurrection as told in the Gospels history? Or is it meant to convey the internal experience of those living long ago? Often you hear bantered about this idea of a kind of mass hallucination, a sort of group perception of what they wanted to see because they were so overcome with grief. Well, there are a number of problems with this explanation. Psychiatrists tell us that individuals have hallucinations, not groups. For a group to be involved, they had to have seen something. Now, they may have misunderstood what they saw, but they saw something. Those people didn't have to have a visual experience of Jesus in the room. In a prayer experience, for example, in an ecstatic experience, they could have said, Jesus has been awakened by God. That's what constitutes an appearance of Jesus. Could that have taken place in a dream? Could it have taken place in a communal prayer moment? Certainly it could have. When Paul in Galatians 1.6 says that Jesus was shown to me as risen, he says he was shown within me, that is to say within his inner consciousness even. Whether visions of the risen Jesus were spiritual revelations or literal sightings, the Gospels differ over where they took place. Luke places all of the appearances in or around Jerusalem. Matthew sets all his episodes in the northern region of Galilee. According to John's Gospel, it is here that the risen Jesus achieves the most crucial task of his time on earth, the appointment of a new leader of the emerging Christian faith. According to John, the story of Jesus' final appearance begins as the disciples go fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Among them is Simon Peter, still tortured by his guilt for having denied Jesus three times before his crucifixion. As they go about their work, they suddenly notice Jesus standing on the shore. When Jesus appears, Peter jumps out of the boat. The first time I actually read this account, I thought that Peter would be swimming in the opposite direction to get away from Jesus, Peter having denied him three times. But what ultimately happens is that the followers join Jesus on the shore and they have breakfast together. And Jesus commissions them, indeed commissions Peter in particular, asking Peter three times, do you love me? And then commanding Peter, feed my sheep. This scene is the way that the gospel has of explaining that the, the message of Jesus must continue, that people who had doubted, that people who had denied can still be redeemed, can still be welcomed, indeed be leaders in that community. But the responsibility of the leader is not to be a sort of taught down CEO, but to be a kind shepherd who will attend to the needs of his flock and will do so in love. Like John, Matthew tells how the risen Jesus calls on his disciples to care for each other and to spread word of his teachings. The encounter he describes occurs not by the sea, but on an unspecified summit in Galilee. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. In religious phenomenology, mountains are typically places of revelation, places of power, places that represent intimacy with the divine. It is a satisfying conclusion to Matthew's gospel it forms a bookend, I am with you always, to the announcement in Matthew's birth narrative that Jesus' name, Emmanuel, means God with us. Matthew writes that even here, 
the disciples still have doubts that they are in the presence of the risen Jesus. I think these expressions of doubt are very significant. This was an unusual, a difficult event. Some of them clearly still couldn't make sense of it. I think that it lends a powerful sense of realism to these accounts, that for many, it was very difficult to accept, and for others, it never was able to be something that they could entirely and completely understand and swallow. By having the courage to record this doubt, the gospel writers allow their own followers to know that doubt is okay, that one can doubt and in fact believe at the same time. After Jesus' proclamation at the summit, Matthew abruptly ends his gospel. He never specifies how the risen Christ departs the earth. Luke carries the story forward, describing how Jesus finally ascends into heaven. The emotional parting happens on the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. We're told that the disciples looked up into heaven to watch, as if waiting for him to return immediately. And they're told by divine messengers, men of Galilee, why are you staring up into heaven? Jesus will come back the same way he left you. The important scene here is not so much that Jesus has disappeared, but what the disciples do following. The idea is one is not supposed to stare up into heaven waiting for divinity to come down and help us out. Our job is to do the work that Jesus started. It isn't long from the time of the ascension of the, of the disappearing of the resurrected Jesus to the event of the coming of the Holy Spirit and of that eternal presence. Luke very much wants to connect those two events. And so it seems highly symbolic in his mind that we understand where one kind of presence is now gone, another kind of presence is now with us. Another mystery remains. Is the New Testament's epic telling of the resurrection the true spark that lit the flame of Christian faith? Or did an entirely different scenario give birth to the idea? Could the truth of the gospel resurrection story be traced to the mind of one grief-stricken fisherman? Every Easter Sunday, Christians relive the Easter narrative in sermon and in song. Whether they accept the New Testament's version of events literally or symbolically, their belief in the risen Christ remains the cornerstone of their faith. But those who see the gospel telling of the resurrection as mere fantasy face a mystery of their own. What series of events 2,000 years ago could have been powerful enough to convince ancient Christians that Jesus had risen from the grave? Some scholars believe that early Christianity began not in a tomb in Jerusalem, but in the northern region of Galilee, in the tortured mind of an inconsolable Simon Peter as he returned to his home and struggled to cope with his unspeakable loss. After the death of Jesus, we may expect that his follower, Simon, had a revelation. In a moment of revelatory experience, it could have taken place in a dream, it could have taken place in prayer, it was revealed to Simon that Jesus' cause was not a failure, that God had rescued him and awakened the dead Jesus into the coming kingdom of God. The resurrection was not an event that took place in time three days after Jesus' death. If you want to call God's rescue of Jesus an event, we'll call it God's deed, and it would have taken place at the crucifixion of Jesus, one would say. The awareness of that supernatural deed, that supernatural event, within quotation marks, would be Simon's revelation, his awakening to the fact that Jesus now was at the right hand of the Father. When Simon got the story, when he had the revelation, that's when the Jesus movement was really born. It's an interesting theory, but I see no grounding for it. Indeed, it strikes me as highly unlikely. 
Were Peter to have announced to his fellow villagers, Jesus has risen, I suspect they would have said to him, Peter, you're nuts. The notion has a certain psychological appeal to us because we're uncomfortable with rather more spectacular religious experiences. The difficulty with this is, A, it's not found in the sources. B, it's terribly individualistic. The witness to the resurrection has to do with the birth, the perseverance, and the transformation of communities rather than simply of individuals. If this kind of power was not at work, it seems to me, what happened inside Peter's head would not have had any impact at all. I really do think, in this case, we have to look more for something like a Big Bang kind of experience, something that genuinely uh, had a communal and experiential dimension, not simply Peter showing up and said, here's something I thought of this morning. The Gospels and Acts and Paul give the sense that the mission, the Christian church, did not begin in the Galilee itself, but rather certainly took root in Jerusalem. So it doesn't track from the testimony of the New Testament itself that it would have been Peter in the Galilee to begin the message of the resurrected Christ. To the contrary, it was women and they were in Jerusalem that began that message. Whatever its origin, the message of the risen Christ possessed a power transcendent enough to jumpstart a world religion. The Apostle Paul defined the resurrection as the measure of Christian belief. If Christ hath not been raised, then is our preaching vain. Your faith also is vain. He is absolutely correct. I do not think you can be a Christian without believing in the resurrection. But that does not tell me what the resurrection means. And it does not tell me when in the resurrection story you are talking literally and when you are talking metaphorically, when you're talking history and when you're talking parable. For example, I believe absolutely in the resurrection, but it does not mean for me what it may mean for some other Christians. For some Christians, the proclamation of the resurrection is the personal assurance that that individual Christian, too, can inherit eternal life. For others, the proclamation of the resurrection is a sign of God's victory, God's redeeming Jesus, God's sanctifying Jesus, a man willing to give up his life despite political pressure to the contrary. For others, the resurrection is simply a nice story that provides a happy ending to the death of a martyr. To believe in the resurrection means to believe that God vindicated the life and the death of Jesus, that what Jesus lived for and died for is not in vain. Jesus died as a martyr for what he had preached, and he did not preach himself. He preached God's justice and mercy for all people. To say that one believes in the resurrection is to say that it's worth living and dying for that kind of justice and mercy for all. Is this what the 80% of Americans who profess belief in the resurrection actually believe? Do they practice what is preached? I would say one of the greatest mysteries about the resurrection is over the centuries you have so many Christians who say that they affirm the resurrection of this teacher but continue to live their lives by some other teaching. They continue to live their lives as if he's molding in his grave somewhere. How can we hold to the miracle and reject the teaching? Most people think of the resurrection not as Jesus entering into God's life, present now, placing a demand on our lives now. They think of it as something that happened in the past. One of the worst things that happened to the resurrection was that it became Easter. And that is that it was fixed as a specific time within the year. So that the resurrection now becomes an event to be preached on in the past rather than an event of the present, which must be responded to. I find it regrettable because at some level, it has enabled us to forget the radical edge of what is really being proclaimed by the resurrection, which is not about celebration of the past, but about 
transformation in the present. To claim and to live by resurrection faith means that you accept that, that justice and not violence rules the world. The absolute hope of resurrection is that if enough of us decide to live like Jesus, we will establish the kingdom of God upon this earth. You are who you've been looking for. So stop looking for more unless you're looking in a mirror because it's about time for you to see clearly that you are who you've been looking for. And that empty feeling you got, that hole in your chest, you only got that feeling because you think you're not blessed with everything you need. You see, we live in a consumerist society, which means they need you to buy stuff. And the easiest way to sell it is to tell you you're not enough. Buy this car, you'll get girls. Buy this bra, you'll get guys. <laughs> and we're seeing it so much that we start believing these lies, but the truth is, the makeup they're selling to make you feel prettier is the same makeup you buy to stop feeling shittier about this lie they keep telling you that you are not enough. <laughs> and what about the movies we watch, all the shows on TV? The more I watch, the more I see I need you to complete me. And yes, love is the answer, love is the key, but if you can't love yourself, how can you ever love me? And, and loving yourself, what does that even mean? Like massages and selfies and that sort of thing? Because the more I think about it, the more it feels weird. I've always been taught that self-love was something to be feared. I'm supposed to love myself, but how do I even do that? Well, I got a trick that I picked up from a friend who noticed that I was quick to defend her when she would say something negative about herself. She would say, I'm so dumb, and I'd say, you're so brilliant. She'd say, I'm so weak, and I'd say, you're so resilient. And when she said, I feel ugly, and I said, you look beautiful, she asked me why I was so dutifully filling up her cup constantly, and yet treating my own cup so irresponsibly. <laughs> because when I looked in the mirror, my voice was quite clear. You're ugly, you're too thin, your hairline's receding, you got a pimple on your chin. And that was when she gave me a piece of advice that changed my life. She gave me a hug and she said, treat yourself like someone you loved. Treat yourself like someone you loved. Now I had been standing, but I needed to be sitting because I couldn't believe that I had been letting myself keep forgetting that I was who I'd been looking for. And deep in my core, I knew it was time to stop looking for more until I could look through all my fear and look into a mirror and see clearly that the man looking back at me was the only one who can make me happy and I am already enough. And I am not any more special or unique than you. That is why I'm here to speak to you. You are already enough. And when you start to see that, you will start to be that. Your world will get brighter, your load will get lighter, and you can see that with life, you can be a lover, not a fighter. And that life, you deserve it. Because you are worth it. And there is no point in letting yourself keep forgetting because no matter what you say or do, you are perfect. And so today, I hope I leave you with a direction correction away from the flaws you see in your reflection. They aren't flaws to me, they are simply protection against all the doubts you have of your perfection. So start today. Take a good, long look in the mirror and say, I am who I've been looking for. do you love yourself because if you understand the value of self-love you'll never be friends with those type of people most of the people out here are running around empty they have no sense of self 
no sense of self-love. When I say self-love, it has nothing to do with celebrity, money, materialistic things, and all of the things that your negative mind could probably go to. It has nothing to do with self-love. It has nothing to do with looks. Nothing to do with cars and any of the superficial things that one would assume that could make you love yourself even more. It's a matter of knowing your value. It's a matter of you saying, I don't have to be around these people in these type of environments and situations in order for me to finally see the value in myself. I love me independent of you loving me. I believe in me. I know my self-worth. I am here and I have a purpose. There is no value in having wisdom, knowledge, insight, spirituality, love. Every day, I am a work in progress. A person who can forgive nothing is a person who's totally destroyed psychologically and emotionally. Forgive your parents. Forgive any relationship that you ever had that didn't work out. Forgive everyone else in your life that has ever hurt you in any way. Forgive yourself. Forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could be any different. I think for myself, and I know many of you, you think forgiving means accepting what has happened to you. Well, it is accepting that it has happened to you. Not accepting that it was okay for it to happen. It is accepting that it has happened, and now what do I do about it? Forgiving is giving up the hope, not holding on, hoping, wishing that it could have been any other way than it actually was. Giving up the hope that the past could be any different. And when I got that, I think it took me to the next level of being a better person because I don't hold grudges for anything or any situation and neither should you. It's letting go so that the past does not hold you prisoner does not hold you hostage. See, life is cyclic. You're not, what is, whatever experience you're having right now, it has not come to stay. It has come to pass. Not to stay, just to pass. It's just going through. The biggest challenge is, is to know what's happening. This is a part of this thing we call life. This too shall pass. And maintaining perspective, putting it in perspective. Let it go and begin to focus on developing myself. And I say to you, you're going to have people to do things to you. Things are going to happen to you. And the most important thing to do is to harness your will and let it go. And move so you can grow. So you can get on with your life. It doesn't matter about what happens to you. What matters is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do now, Les? But if you want to begin to move into your own personal greatness, if you want to begin to really enjoy a happy, successful, healthy life, you've got to be willing to go against the tide. You've got to be willing to harness your will. So as you're in the process of reinventing your life, write a description of the kind of person that you want to be. What are the things that you must overcome? What qualities about your personality you know that you're going to have to change because those particular characteristics are liabilities to you? What are your assets? What are your strong points? Look at and evaluating yourself to make that determination. Other thing is that in order to get out of a rut, we need some coaching. Find some trusted critics. People that you know care about you and love you. 
there's some things that keeps us from growing and getting out of ruts. Number one, we identify with feedback. We take it personal when someone wants to give us some feedback on where we are falling short and tell us about our blind spots. We want to have everything being positive about us. We're not perfect. It's, it hurts. I, I have a friend who's a trusted critic. I don't like him, but I love him. He doesn't tell me the things I want to hear. He tell me what I need to hear so I can grow. It hurts. It hurts when he put me on the hot seat. I can't stand it. But that's the only way that I can grow. And I'm glad that he loves me enough to risk our friendship to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Stop scaring yourself. How often do you terrorize yourself with your own thoughts? You get into absolute terror and it's only coming from your thoughts. Nobody out there is doing a thing. Sometimes it's an old family pattern. Sometimes we get new things. I would like people, to, when you have time, to make a list of your fears. Make a list of your fears. And then give yourself the opportunity to turn each fear into a positive affirmation. Turn each one into something positive. And remember, always you are in charge. You are always in charge. See, one idle thought doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Thoughts are like drops of water. You drop a drop of water and it doesn't mean much. But if you keep dropping and keep dropping, you get a puddle on the floor, and then you can get a little pond and a lake, and finally you can create an ocean. And with our own thoughts, we can drown in a sea of negativity, or we can float on the ocean of life. And it's up to us. The thoughts we think accumulate. And what sort of puddles are you standing in? Or are you up to here? Or are you up to here and trying to paddle? Now, what are you doing to yourself? When we're willing to change our thinking, we can change our experiences. And it doesn't matter if you've got a big a puddle of negative thoughts. You know, you can move over here and create a puddle of mindfulness, positive thoughts. You can make changes, always. So you want to turn those fear thoughts into positive affirmations. Let them work for you.